Okay, welcome back for more Bio 370. So this is going to be week 12, lecture 1, dealing with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So our objectives, only fulfill one slide because we're going to go through some examples and I don't necessarily want you to like memorize the examples. It's more, do you get the big picture? So when we get there, don't feel like you need to memorize and remember everything that's going on. So obviously what we're going to do today, <clears throat> so last time we dealt with how we can modify genes, and one of the easiest ways to do that is by using restriction enzymes, or restriction endonucleases, REs. These cut at what we call restriction sites, which are targets, and they're going to be unique for whatever it is, so like eco R1 turned out to be G-A-A-T-T-C and it cuts between that G and the A. And when you do this, you create what we call a sticky end, where you can recombine or stick these sticky ends together. You do not need to memorize the actual restriction sites for restriction enzymes. That's just dumb. Like in the homework, you weren't told them because you could look them up, but if it were on a quiz or on the final, I would just tell you what the restriction site is. Don't memorize them. When we recombine DNA from different sources, we call that recombinant DNA. And we can use these enzymes to map things, kind of like we used recombination to map. We can use restriction digestion to map. When you do this, you use restriction digestion of different types. So you usually have some type of uncut one enzyme, second enzyme, then you would combine the two. And between these different cuts, or these different treatments, in this particular case, four of them, you run a gel electrophoresis to look at what the fragment sizes are, and then you could start to put them together using, you know, bits of logic. We used PUC18 to do this, because PUC18 has a multiple cloning site, and that makes it <coughs> really easy, because we know that in the 2.7 KB of PUC18, the only place that we will do the cutting is in that multiple cloning site. And obviously, circular problems are harder than linear ones. <clears throat> so, what if we could custom order our restriction enzymes? Well, that would be the overall concept of CRISPR-Cas9. So, the basic idea is we're going to have a target sequence, and what we're going to do is, once that target is identified, is we're going to make a double-stranded break, a DSB. And the question is, how do we repair this double-stranded break? We turn out to have two methods. One of them is non-homologous end-joining. That's what's shown here. Non-homologous end-joining results in either random insertions or random deletions. So we get indels as a result of this. Or we can use homologous or, you know, homology-directed recombination. Meaning if I were to give a similar sequence, I could then use recombination and correct the mistake, correct the break that way. Non-homologous end joining is usually what happens using CRISPR-Cas9, but when we wish to edit genes, we use homology-directed recombination. So this is going to be for gene editing. And this happens naturally, but the question then becomes, well, what if we can target certain sequences? How does that work? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the idea of CRISPR-Cas9 first emerged in the 18, or the, excuse me, in the 1980s, when CRISPR was found, and CRISPR stands for the Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats, hence CRISPR. This is actually a figure from the paper that actually demonstrated this, and what you end up getting is this portion right here, <clears throat> which is 29 base pairs in length. It does turn out to be a palindrome, meaning it's symmetrical if we look at its reverse complement, just like we would see that with the restriction enzymes. And we happen to have these pieces here, these palindromes, that would be regularly interspersed, but in between we'd have, you know, these other weird things that weren't these palindromes. 
So we get these palindromic repeats. And then we have these things here that we call spacers, which kind of space out these repeats. Turns out about 40% of bacteria and almost all of the archaeans that we've looked at happen to have these. In 2002, we found these things called Cas9 proteins, and Cas9 proteins are endonucleases. And it turns out that these endonucleases don't have restriction sites. They are guided to them via CRISPR RNA. And it turned out in 2005, we figured out what these spacers were. They are phage DNA, which means we are looking at a bacterial immune system, which is kind of genius. So, what's the overall method by which this works. So we get our CRISPR array, and what we're going to do is transcribe it. There turn out to be all these different types. We are only going to care about type 2, so we can just chop all this stuff right on out. We don't care for any of this. How often do you get to just say, let's ignore parts of a picture? What we're going to make as a result of, you know, transcription, is we're going to make this line up here, and this is going to be a CRISPR RNA, CRRNA. From a different location, what we're going to have are transacting CRISPR RNAs, which are going to be down here. So these transacting CRISPR RNAs, or tracer RNAs, and CRISPR RNA is CRRNA are going to bind to portions of it. So the, Chris, the, the, the tracer RNA comes from a different source. And it's going to bind to portions of the CRISPR RNA in what we call protospacers. It's going to then be chopped up where you see those little arrows via an enzyme RNase 3. What we end up having is our functional CRISPR RNA with a tracer RNA attached. The CRISPR RNA with the tracer RNA is capable of binding to that enzyme, that endonuclease, which is Cas9, which you see down here. And the CRISPR RNA is going to serve as a guide, so it's going to be a hunting tool. And what it's going to do is any place that can bind, so if we get complementary binding, complementary binding, under certain circumstances, Cas9 is then going to cleave the target and form double-stranded breaks. And the result will be either degradation or destruction or some, some, other, some other type of damage. When we want to know, well, is it going to target anywhere, the answer is, well, no, not particularly. So in order for the Cas9 to really start to function, it needs to find what we call a protospacer adjacent motif, which is a PAM. And the sequence for PAM turns out to be some nucleotide GG. So it could be an AGG, GGG, TGG, CGG. Doesn't matter, it just needs to be something GG. That is what this PAM turns out to be. And it turns out that we need that PAM next to the recognition site. Meaning the sequence that we are hunting for needs to have PAM somewhat near it. So if I were to look at DNA to then add in that CRISPR RNA right here, which is being referred to up here as a guide. So what I'm going to do is you will notice that we will build a base pair here. The PAM sequence is going to be found on the opposite strand. So the PAM is not going to be found 
on you know what complements the CRISPR RNA. It's going to be on the opposite strand, so the template to the complementary strand. So how can we make what we end up calling guide RNA or short guide RNAs? Because you know this process is all nice and great, but what if we like combine it all into one piece? So we can take tracer RNA that bacteria would make, and we can take that CRISPR RNA, which is the target. And we can say, well, what if we can combine it all together and make a short guide RNA? So that's what we do. So if you look at this figure here, what we have up here in this portion turns out to be the CRISPR RNA. This down here in red is the tracer RNA. But what if we just lobbed off some of these chunks and linked them together? So if I do that, making what we call a chimera, a chimera I can make my guide RNA. What does this contain? It contains my target sequence, so this is what I'm going to aim for. And it contains components necessary to combine with Cas9. So that way, all I need to do is inject into an organism, you know, with a needle or whatever, whatever it takes to create the guide RNA and inject into it Cas9. And if I do that, voila, I can now start editing basically whatever I want. So I want to walk through some examples of how this would work. And these are going to be from actual studies. So one of them is going to be sickle cell. <clears throat> so sickle cell disease is due to a mutation in hemoglobin, in particular the beta subunit of hemoglobin S. The mutation is when we go from a valine to a glutamate or a glutamic acid or a glutamate, so we know where this mutation actually occurs. Why do we keep sickle cell around? Well, sickle cell disease actually confers malarial resistance. But if we have it in a hybrid form, a heterozygote form, we call that HBA, HBS, this one here is called sickle cell trait. So it's like you have sickle cell disease, but you don't have all the really bad side effects of it, and you also get to be resistant to malaria. What's interesting about the sickle cell trait, or the disease itself, is it's only found in adult hemoglobin. It is not found in what we would call fetal hemoglobin. And that's because, if you look at the figure, fetal hemoglobin, hemoglobin is made out of four subunits, in fetal, it's made out of alphas and gammas, whereas in adults, it's alphas and betas. And if you recall from what I said previously, it's the beta that actually goes wrong. So what we tend to notice is at birth, you start to produce more betas than you do gammas. So the gammas drop off, betas increase, and then usually around three months of age, we start to get the disease starts to show up of sickle cell. So, what they did in this study is they treated hemopoietic stem cell and progenitor cells, meaning the cells that eventually give you red blood cells, and they're going to treat it, or target, this particular gene, BCL11A. This is the gene that produces the beta um, globins. So what we're going to try and do, using CRISPR, is to downregulate BCL11A, Hope that increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin, meaning that gamma subunit that shows up. And what do they end up seeing as a result of this experiment? They have an 80% reduction in HBS, meaning we are because we're not expressing the beta, we're expressing the gamma, we're not getting as much sickle cell disease. Okay, so how did they do this? Well, they made their guide RNA had this chunk right here, which is our target, and the target turned out to be in the BCL11A gene. And what they did was the target turned out to have a PAM right next to it, and they destroyed it.
using a double-stranded break. And the goal would be is if you know this gene isn't being expressed, they will hopefully express and make the gamma globin. And then which is needed for hemoglobin F. That's the goal. So the way they did this was they took some stem cells it's called CTX001 and what they did was they modified these and these turn out to be cells that we could use to end up producing blood cells. What they did was they modified them using viruses and these are going to be viruses that contain that single guide RNA and they also contain Cas9. So the goal will be to take out, so to destroy, not necessarily destroy, that's not the right word, to downregulate the BCL11A expression so that hopefully we get more fetal hemoglobin being formed. One of the questions that they were curious about was, you know, what if this thing screws up and it targets the wrong area? We call those off-target mutations. So they use a technique called guide-seek. Guide-seek is written down here, so it's genome-wide unbiased identification of double-stranded breaks enabling, enabled by sequencing. And the way it works is, if you get a double-stranded break, you can insert into it a double-stranded, so DS is double-stranded, ODN is oligo uh, deoxy nucleotides. So that's very fancy speak for they're going to put in a bunch of random nucleotides. We can identify these. We're going to PCR it up, and what we're hoping to see is this is going to be in the BCL11A gene. And this here should also be the BCL11A gene. So if we only PCR up and see that gene, that means it's the only place where we had the breaks. Hooray, it worked. They looked at 223 potentials, and um, they didn't see any off-target breaks. So the therapy worked. So... What they did is, in the patient, they took out all of the hemopoietic stem cells, and that's called myeloablation, and then they replaced those cells with those modified cells, so the CTX001, so the one I mentioned previously. Then they put them into the patients, looked at what happened. You can see the article here if you want. This is for patient one. And what they happened to notice is in terms of months after the infusion, so here's the start, is you notice a decrease in hemoglobin A, and then we had a dramatic increase in hemoglobin F, meaning we were expressing the fetal hemoglobin, which does not, um, it can't have the sickle cell trait that appears. So much so that 15 months after the infusion, you know, 95% of the tissue turned out, or the cells turned out to have the fetal hemoglobin, which is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. We also turned out to see, you know, we can see this using those cells, you know, afterwards in terms of how many of those cells were basically hemoglobin producing cells, vast majority of them, hooray. One of the things that people worried about that comes with sickle cell is VOCs, which are vaso-occlusive crises. So I know it looks like a misspelled cries, but it's crises. So this is when you actually end up getting like little blood clots that show up because of the shape of the, of the sickled cells. So 17, basically 17 months after the treatment, um, in patient number one, they didn't find any VOCs. This turned out to be repeated 31 more times in other patients, you know, varying degrees of success. But for the most part, it was eliminating sickle cell disease. Second potential study for you is actually a modification of CRISPR. So alcohol use disorder, AUD, 
if done during teenage years, results in anxiety, high anxiety, and also reduce or promotes binge drinking, so consuming more and more and more alcohol. And there's a gene involved with this, which is called ARC. And it's involved with synaptic plasticity, meaning your brain rewires itself, and that's synaptic plasticity. Very, very, very simplified. And it is regulated by an element called snare, which is an enhancer element that's you know about 7,000 bases in before the ARC transcription starts site. And what we've noticed about all this is during binge drinking, so this alcohol use disorder, we get heterochromatin formation out here by ARC and SARE within the amygdala. So the amygdala is a portion of the brain that's involved with emotions and fears. Hence, the anxiety component. So one of the questions that we had was, well, what if you could stop heterochromatin formation? Meaning, we see that this is what's happening as a result of this binge drinking. So if we can prevent the heterochromatin from forming, so if we can uncondense the chromatin, could this result in a reversal of these symptoms? So again, if you're an adolescent, we expose you to ethanol a whole bunch. What we're going to end up doing is taking your euchromatin and turning it into heterochromatin. So we're going to add all these methylation groups. We're going to remove acetylation groups or acetyls. The result is we have less plasticity, and we can measure that by looking at ARC expression, and we get more anxiety and alcohol drinking. If, however, we can undo this, we should be able to form more euchromatin, and everything is all okay. So, what did they do? Well, they gave rats alcohol after they were born. This was done eight or 28 to 41 days after they were born. This is equivalent to being a 10 to an 18-year-old in humans, based upon their lifespan. And then what happened was they were given a cannula, so a super thin tube, into their brain that contained DCAS9 P300. So DCAS9 is a disabled Cas9. So this can hold on to single guide RNA, but it won't cleave anything. P300 is a histone acetyl transferase, meaning these two were tethered together. So this one here is non-functional, and the P300 will add acetyl marks, which means we should have acetylation, which means we should get more euchromatin. Interesting. So we'll acetylate whatever it targets. So in terms of looking at the flow chart, they were either given ethanol or saline for those periods of times. They were then given the cannula. In the cannula, they're going to be given a virus that contains, so in this virus, it's going to contain like the single guide RNA, or it's going to contain the disabled Cas9 P300. And then wait after a while, we're going to observe their behavior. We have to get brain tissues, so we have to unalive the rats, and you know, that's that's sad. But ultimately, what we're going to look at is do we get more expression? So, what did they see? Well, they could check their anxiety and their alcohol reactions, and then one of the ways that they could do that is by exposing them to light or inducing anxiety. So, based upon these treatments, we can see how do they re respond to anxiety, because that was one of the conditions, and what do we see? Well, if we look at up here, where it says time and open arms, so being exposed, if they're given saline, they turn out to be the exact same, meaning um, whether you give them, so if you look green, is you're giving them the disabled cast mine, and the dark green is giving the disabled Cas9 and the guide RNA, and it doesn't really do anything. But if I look at the alcohol ones, the ones that aren't given the guide RNA, they actually don't spend as much time outside, which means they're more anxious. But if we correct it, they're less anxious. 
oh, so this seems like it might work. This one here is just to say that, hey, look, we, we tested them the same number of times. This one here is looking at them being in the light or in the dark. If they're in the light, they tend to be more anxious. So again, the saline controls, nothing happened. But if you turn out to have alcohol and we don't correct it, it's less time in the light, which means, again, more anxious. Yet, it's corrected again. They're both given the same number of times to move back and forth. When we look at what happened with the mRNA, ARC expression is way down in alcohol, so it's downregulated in alcohol and not corrected. Yet, between the salines and our ability to fix it, there's no difference between them, so it is indeed the alcohol and we're not correcting it, yet we can fix the problem. Same thing when we look at those acetylation marks. We actually have a significant drop in the acetylation marks. If you add the alcohol and we don't fix. So all this is pointing to, hey, we're kind of fixing the problem. If we look here in G, this is looking at binge drinking. So again, purple is give them alcohol, but we don't fix the problem. They binge drink, whereas the others do not. And sugar doesn't seem to be affected by anything. So if you give them sugar water, it doesn't affect that. So what did we ultimately see from this? We see more arc expression. We get Sarah acetylation. We have reduced anxiety. We have reduced alcohol consumption. Holy cow! If you actually look at the paper, they also do a reciprocal experiment using something called CRAB, which is actually promoting heterochromatin. So this one here, what you should see is you should be able to turn the saline into... Um, I should write this so you can read it. You could turn the saline treatment to look like the ethanol high anxiety uh, phenotype. Which is what you want to show. Like, hey, see, it works, but if we also undo it, we also get the same result. How does this apply to humans? Great question. One of the things that I know virologists like to say is my sly and monkeys exaggerate. So what does this mean for humans? I don't know, because mice are not humans, and humans are not mice. The problem with all this is we have some ethical problems, because gene therapy is not germline editing. So if we change somatic cells, like what we saw in all of this, so affecting the brain or affecting hemopoietic stem cells, those changes do not get inherited to the next generation. However, if you change germline cells, you can pass those on. So what made the news in 2018 was Dr. He Xiang Qiu said that he edited the genomes of two girls. Here's the article from which it came, and here's his YouTube video. Um, their father turned to have HIV, and the worry was, uh-oh, he's going to pass it on to the kids. Not sure how that would happen, but okay, whatever. So what he did, Dr. Uh, Zhang Hu, is he edited the CCR5, which is a co-receptor for HIV infection, so that the girls could not get HIV. Um, there were some issues with this. So usually if you wish to experiment on humans, you have to do all sorts of ethical paperwork and all that stuff and he faked all of them so um, he made up papers from his university where he was studying he made up papers that the Chinese government said it was all okay no one actually said that um, so turns out he was found guilty of human experimentation he was given three years in jail and then you know almost a half million dollar fine he was released in 2022 he is currently making a lot of money going around and talking about stuff. 
he also did not release information about whether or not there were off-target mutations, which is kind of a big deal. There are international rules about human genome editing, especially if it's heritable. So um, typically what is accepted is if you use any type of embryo editing, you must terminate at the blastocyst, the blastocyst stage, which is uh, you go from being a solid ball of cells to becoming a hollow ball of cells. So at this stage here, you have to call it quits because we don't want it to move past that where we start to have differentiation and what have you. There's actually several reviews of ethics that have come out. Here's a link to this particular one that actually talks about here's a lot of the international laws that and rules that concern CRISPR. Um, it's more of like a public shunning than it is like going to jail. He was in trouble for falsifying documents, but it's not like, uh oh, you broke science laws, therefore you go to science jail. So there's still some issues. One of the questions that was asked is, were there off-target, you know, changes? And Columbia, in 2020, actually performed a study about an EYS. So the EYS stands for Eyes Shut Homologue. And this turns out to be a blindness disorder. It's found on chromosome number 6. And there was a sperm donor who turned out to have this condition, and they wanted to see, hey, can we fix this? So can we correct this phenomenon? So we had, you know, oocyte, we had sperm, and we wanted to use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit this to see, is it even possible? So again, this would be move to the blastocyst stage and then stop. So they did this with seven different embryos using these sperm donors. What they found was three of them were corrected, but four of them were kind of sort of wrecked. And with those that were wrecked, it's because we lost part of chromosome 6. That results in an aneuploidy. And most aneuploidies are non-viable, which is kind of not good. So their target, they had their guide RNA, they had a PAM sequence. This is where they were going to go for the double-strand break. What you can do is you could also include in it, so when you include the single guide RNA and you add Cas9, you could also include like a plasmid that says, hey, this is what I want it to correct. So sometimes you can do that. Here it turns out it was a frame shift. So it was the hope of, hey, can we correct the frame, sh frame shift? Because if you remember, non-homologous end joining, what you do is you, you either have insertions or deletion. So hope, hope that uh, fixed it. And um, that, that's not what happened at all. So when we look at this, we took our modified sperm, put it into the oocyte. We let them move until the blastocyst stage. What they did was they can look at, you know, those blastocyst cells, and they can also look at the embryonic stem cells. And we looked at the blastocyst cells, again, down here at, uh, it's not letting me put my arrow, but I'm trying to circle, there it goes. When we look at the blastocysts, we actually had either indels, so we kind of sort of fixed it, but we also had a whole bunch that had a loss, over half of them, were a loss in a chromosome. So when they went hunting and biopsies of these embryos, they could sit there and see, like, hey, look, you know, we had, for the most part, you know, everything was functional. So we had the heterochromatin, hooray, and hip, hip. Mother's there. It's all good. But in some of these, we get a total loss. So somehow in here we lost the father's contribution. And this is because an entire chunk of the chromosome was lost and it was not repaired. We also got the exact same thing where we actually get a monosomy. So we actually totally lose the entirety of the dad. And um, 
both of these are bad. These, the, both of these are very bad. And again, this happened over half of the time. So what seems to be the pattern? So the mature cells seem to be editable. But these embryonic ones don't seem to be that edible. Um, that doesn't mean it always will. Obviously, there's some questions as to why that is, but um, yeah, this is kind of uh, this is kind of a worrisome if we were to attempt to use this. It doesn't mean it will always be this way, but as of right now, it's it's not looking good. In lab this week, what you're going to be doing is something called a four corners bait. Um, I posted a document in week 11, and it'll also be under week number 12. You're going to want to look for one that says four corners debate. And what you're going to be doing is discussing opinions about heritable human genome editing. So, the goal is to be respectful in your discussion. And when you're bringing up points, you're going to want to cite articles. So you're given a whole bunch of well-thought-out articles here. Again, the point is not to see who wins. It's actually explore maybe not your opinion. Because I know for me, if you were to ask me where I land, it's a it, it depends because I need context. Because I'm not an I'm not a very good absolutist in this one, and if you are, hopefully you will be asked to think of the alternative. And if you know you're not really opinionated, hopefully this will lead you to want to start to think about this, and maybe you should form an opinion. Next time, we're going to talk about genetically modified organisms, and then we're going to start talking about our last topic, which is population genetics. So we're going to start off small by talking about CODIS.